okay, so where do morals come from? Ben All gives right. the answer in eight so, minutes. All right, so this is my uh, opening statement. Uh, tonight's debate asks the question, where do morals come from? That is, what are morals? Are they objective or subjective? And what are their source? I will defend the position that morals are objective values and duties that describe what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, and these being manifestations of God's good and perfect nature. Simply put, morals are objectively real and come from a real moral law giver who is God. As I understand, Bernie will defend the position that morals are guides to inform us on how best to attain human well-being, and that these have come through naturalistic evolutionary processes and human reasoning. On his position, identifying moral values and duties are akin to solving a mathematical problem. Like math, we evolve and continue to advance our moral reasoning and arrive at correct answers. Thus, morals are not based on a moral law giver, but are rather rules that we have developed to promote human well-being. Let me say a few things before I get into the meat of my position and why I think Bernie's position fails to adequately account for morals and duties. First, I want to make very clear that I'm not saying that you must believe in God to be a moral person. Let me say that again. I'm not saying that you have to believe in God to be a moral person. I know many atheists, Bernie included, who do great things and hold to high moral standards. What I am claiming is that a worldview without God provides no ultimate foundation for that morality and that the atheist who is moral is so in spite of their worldview. Second, I think there will be many areas of agreement between Bernie and I. Uh, his position, as I understand it, is very close to that of Sam Harris that he puts forth in his book, The Moral Landscape. I agree with Bernie and Sam that human reasoning and science can and should be tools for helping to determine the best course of action to result in a desired outcome. Where we will disagree, however, is what or who prescribes the desired outcome in the first place and what gives such outcomes moral qualities of right and wrong, good or evil. Why ought this outcome be and that outcome ought not to be? This, I think, will be the crux of our difference tonight. With that said, let me say what I believe we mean by moral values and duties. Moral values describe what is good or evil, measured against some reference of good or evil. Moral duties describe what we ought or ought not to do, that we are obligated to some agent to whom these duties are due. Now, a very important question arises about the nature of morals. Are morals objective properties of certain actions and behaviors, or are morals subjective beliefs in people's minds? Let's take the example of rape. When we say that rape is wrong, are we describing a property of rape, that is, the object, or are we describing a property of our belief, that is, the subject? What if nobody actually believed that rape was wrong? Would it still be objectively wrong? I think yes, because moral value is a property of the rape itself. Here's an illustration. This pen is resting on the table. If I asked you uh, if the pen was resting on the table, you would all say yes. But if you couldn't see the pen, there would still be an objective truth about the state of the pen resting on the table, regardless of your belief about it. The state of the pen is an objective truth about the pen and that truth doesn't depend on whether anyone holds the belief about its state. So the question is, are morals, like the pen on the table, objective truth that, truths that measure the nature of actions and behaviors, or are they descriptions of subjective beliefs of people? Let's take another example. The Nazis believed that it was morally right to exterminate homosexuals. Suppose the Nazis had won the war and over time convinced everyone that they were right to have successfully exterminated homosexuals. But despite the fact that everybody now believes it was right, is it? No. This is because what they did was objectively wrong. The moral wrongness was in the behavior and the action, not dependent on the people's belief about the behavior and the action. Examples like this of the Nazis and, and examples like torturing babies for fun show that moral values and duties are objective properties of behaviors and actions and not subjective properties of people's beliefs. People may come to believe something objectively wrong is, in fact, wrong, but it is not their belief that makes it wrong. It is the object itself that possesses the moral quality of wrongness. Whether morals are objective or subjective is important because if they are subjective, then they lose any prescriptive or obligatory power. They become simply descriptions of people's beliefs and preferences. They describe what is, not what ought to be. Often, naturalists will explain moral behavior as a result of sociobiological evolution, that certain behavior results in better survival for the species, and these behaviors become moral norms. If morals are subjective, 
And what we call moral behavior is just a complex interaction of matter and energy and time and space, which plausibly could originate through natural law and processes. I will grant the naturalist an evolutionary explanation if morals are simply descriptions of what is and not prescriptions of what ought to be. On the other hand, if morals are objective and if they do possess prescriptive and obligatory power, then no naturalistic explanation can account for the oughtness of these objective values and duties. Natural law and processes may explain how things are, but say nothing about how things ought to be. If, on the other hand, morals are objective realities, then what is their source? Their source must have within its nature the standard of morality by which moral values are measured and the rightful authority to demand moral duties. This source must be a perfectly moral and righteous being. This perfectly moral and righteous being is reasonably God. God, therefore, best explains where morals come from. Now, I expect that Bernie will object and join with Sam Harris in proposing an alternative, a moral landscape which can be traversed to higher and higher peaks by moral reasoning informed by science. Morals are behaviors and actions that promote well-being and that are effective and ineffective ways to arrive at well-being. Through our evolution as sentient beings, we have developed increasingly rational capabilities to reason through these moral problems. This is a seductive alternative, but there are three fundamental problems with it that Bernie and Sam will have to overcome. First, on naturalism, why ought sentient well-being be promoted? What is it about certain complex arrangements of matter and energy and time and space that inherit an oughtness about its being that should be promoted? How, in principle, can naturalism deliver any prescription of what ought to be at all? Bernie will have to explain, using only the resources of naturalism, how a descriptive is can become a prescriptive ought. Second, not only is Harris's principle of well-being lacking oughtness, it is very ambiguous. What exactly is well-being, and by what measure is it reckoned? On naturalism, what reference are we to use to adjudicate between differing beliefs? Where does the oughtness of a particular belief of well-being come from? On naturalism, there is no objective measure of well-being, only subjective beliefs about it. Third, we must be cautious about equivocation on these, in these discussions. Equivocation means using the same word but with different meanings of the word. For example, good can mean either good in the moral sense or good in the sense of effective. On naturalism, good only means effective. It carries no moral weight. Bernie and Sam may develop methods that are good in the effective sense but not in the moral sense. So in, in conclusion to my opening remarks, I have argued that morals objectively are real and prescribe what ought to be grounded in God's perfect nature. I have argued that naturalism can only provide what is. Naturalism cannot prescribe what ought to be, and thus fails to deliver objective moral values and duties. I have also cautioned against the temptation to equivocate on terms like good and right in dialoguing about morality. And I look forward to Bernie's comments with these things in mind. Thank you, Ben. Okay, uh, now I'll start. Uh, and I have a handout here, too. Does everybody have a handout? Copy? Um, there we go. Anybody else need? There we go. Looks like PowerPoint slides. Okay. Does anybody want to outline for today's program also? This shows when people are going to ask questions and stuff. Okay. All right. So I'll start here. Okay, where do morals come from? First off, let's start with what is morality? And the Oxford English Dictionary says principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. So really it's quite simple. Let's not overcomplicate this. It's really all about, you know, if you ask a question, what's the right or wrong thing to do here, or the good or, good or bad, that's morality. That's what morality is. And I think Ben and I have common ground on that. I think we both agree that's a good definition for morality. Now the next question is where we differ is you say, what is right, what is wrong? You know, what is that? And my answer is, it's pretty simple. It's just that right and good are things that lead to flourishing and pleasure, and wrong or bad are things that lead to pain. So if you're going to do things that increase the pain in the world, essentially that's bad. That's 
wrong. And if you do things that are good to make people flourish, and by flourish I mean imagine a test tube of little bacteria. If you do something to this test tube, like put in certain nutrients, they flourish when they get the right stuff they want, you know, the right sunlight, the right food, whatever. And if you put something toxic in there, they're going to die. So by flourishing, I just mean well-being, things that make us have the best possible life. So what does Ben think right and wrong simply means? This is something where I don't think he really has a clear definition. I, I think he thinks right and wrong basically is right is what God commands and wrong is what is against his commands. And you don't really have a... You, don't, you can't really judge for yourself what's right or wrong. So that's one thing I hope to clarify later with Ben. So how do we know, how can we decide if there's a moral question, how do we know what's right or wrong? Uh, what, what kind of principles? And I have three principles that I, I, I think that are good for logically thinking about this. Reciprocity, which is treating others as you want to be treated yourself. And the reason for these three, by the way, is because these have shown to work. They're successful at what they do to show that it's the best way to reach human flourishing. So the first one is reciprocity. The next one is consequentialism, where you look at uh, your potential behaviors and see what the outcomes might be. Based on that, you would pick out which you think is the best behavior. And the third thing is individual rights, which basically is boiled down to as long as you don't hurt anybody else, it's, it's basically OK. So some, some moral issues, they tie in all three of these, some of these, some of them just hit one of these. Some of them like rape, you know, they kind of like violate every, every one of them. That's why it seems so obvious to be a bad thing. Now, the, a good way that I think to explain this is a, consider it a map. A map, for example, let's say I want to go to the store from here. What's the best way to get to the store? There's, there's, some, map, there's some directions that are direct, directly to the store. Those are the good directions. Some of them might go in the opposite direction. That's the worst possible direction. And so morals are the same thing, except for how to get to it. Instead of how to get to a place, you say, how do you get to a, a designation that's uh, a more of a society thing? So for example, um, let's say we, wanna, we, we don't want any starving children in the world, or we don't want children in pain, or children that are ignorant. Uh, we want to educate them. So how do you best do that? You build the path to that. You know, maybe it's good to ha have a, a law that they must be in school. You know, that could be, that's a moral issue. Now, an immoral issue might be to go the opposite way and say, like, oh, well, don't teach kids anything. In fact, punish them if you find them trying to read a book. You know, so that's, those are the evil things. They're, they're going just the opposite direction and doing more harm. Um, by the way, Christopher Hitchens said evil is basically like doing bad on stilts. So, like, if you mug somebody, that's bad. But evil is when you mug them and then you just stab them 100 times and kick them while they're down and, you know, abuse their body and just go overboard, you know. So I, I like that definition of, of good and evil. Um, or uh, evil, anyway. And Ben said, uh, well, what about oughtness? You have no moral weight for that. Well, oughtness is just what you ought to do to get there. So if, just like if I want to go to Safeway, I ought to take this path to get there the best way. In the same way, if I want to feed children or or reduce suffering for children, this is what I ought to do. It's really not a mystery how you get an ought. Um, it's just a simple, it's just simply the best way to get to that path. Uh, one philosophical tool that people use is the veil of ignorance. And, you know, in a children's example, this is what a lot of people experience in their homes. Let's say there's one piece of pie, and so the parent might say, okay, these two kids are fighting over this piece of pie. So one, one kid can cut the pie, the other kid will choose. And that, of course, the first kid uh, because he doesn't know which one he's, the other kid's going to choose, it's called the veil of ignorance, where he has to make it fair because he doesn't want to get ripped off. So, for example, tax rates. What are the best tax rates? Should we tax the poor or not? Well, you use the veil of ignorance. Pre pretend like you don't know the future for yourself. You might be a handicapped person uh, for the next 30 years in your life with no income, or you might win the lottery tomorrow and have $10 million. What, what do you think is the best tax rate with this veil of ignorance, not knowing how, what, how you're going you're to be. Now, one of the problems with saying morality comes from God is that there's a lot of gross morality in the Bible supposedly coming from God. For example, in Deuteronomy 22, it says, if you suspect a woman is a, a non-virgin on her wedding night, you should kill her. Now, obviously, that's not worthy of the death penalty. And I can't imagine a father killing his daughter for something like that, because I have a daughter. 
Um, and then there's the Noah's Ark story. I know Ben believes that there really was a Noah's Ark in a local area that killed all the humans except for the eight, eight that were on the Ark. Well, that's worse than genocide. I mean, that's, there's never been a genocide that major before if that were really to happen. And what did it accomplish? I mean, humans haven't really changed. So it, what is that? Just God throwing a temper tantrum? And another thing is that they say, well, we inherited sin because of Adam's sin. Well, that's not very just. That's not fair. Um, actually, the Bible has contradictory statements where in one place it might say the children have to pay for the sins of their fathers. And then another one, there's another verse where it says they will not. So there's contradictory messages there. And then, you know, just to go right at the throat of the gospel, I mean, the whole gospel doesn't make sense because uh, Jesus is supposed to die a substitutionary death on our behalf. Well, how does that make sense if I kill somebody and somebody says, okay, well, instead of Bernie getting the death penalty, let me, let me die for him. That, that's not justice. That's a perversion of justice. And, you know, and that's just on top of the whole thing not making sense because God sacrificed his son. And, you know, in the Bible it talks about um, God condemns child, sac uh, child sacrifice in Jeremiah 7.31. He said, that's something that never entered my mind. And yet... He commanded Abraham to sacrifice his own son Isaac, and Jesus is said to be God's son, sacrificed for sin, and this was all planned from the foundation of the world according to Revelation. So, you know, on the one hand, God says, I, I would never do such a gross thing, and another, on the other hand, it's like that's the core of the gospel, is that he sacrificed his own son, which is also himself, and he's a god. Gods are immortal, but he died on a cross. I mean, all this stuff is just, just nonsense on top of nonsense. Um... One time I was in a debate and I asked, a Christian said, we can be thankful to God for everything. I said, even hell? He goes, yeah, even hell. And it's like, how, how could you be thankful for hell? Because, I mean, if you, if you are a mass murderer and you ask for forgiveness on your deathbed, I mean, he said because it's ultimate justice. But it's not justice because it's perverted because if you repent, you don't go to hell. And if you're a murder victim and you don't believe in Jesus, well, now you're going to hell. I mean, that, there's no sense in justice there. It's, a, it's an injustice. It's a perversion of justice. Then there's the problem of evil where a lot of bad things happen. And this is the problem of evil because it's a philosophical problem because they say Jesus is all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful. And yet, here's a tsunami in 2004 in the Indian Ocean that killed the hundred, hundreds of thousands of people and displaced millions of people. And in the Bible says Jesus holds all things together. So here Jesus held together this tsunami because it wouldn't exist without him holding it together. So why is Jesus killing a couple hundred thousand people and displacing millions? All that pain and suffering. So th these are conflicts with this ancient theology in the Bible with what we know now with modern science. You know, I mean, obviously, from a naturalistic viewpoint, the tsunami is just a matter of tectonic plates. But the ancient theology says, oh, Jesus holds everything together and Jesus does everything. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring out is that animals, there's animal studies and they show that they, they show rudimentary signs of um, justice. You know, there's one YouTube video where this, these monkeys are perfectly happy getting cucumbers, but when one sees the other monkey getting a grape, he, he throws the cucumber back in a fit. That's, that's kind of funny. Um, one final thing is, you know, a lot of atheists say good without God. I just want to say that's, that's not really, that kind of bothers me a little bit because it's not the same good. I mean, it, it implies that, oh, Christians are good and we can be good without God too. But the thing is, is there, there are different kinds of good. Uh, for example, um, uh, a Catholic would say birth control is bad, is evil. And I would say no, it's just opposite. Birth control is very empowering to women and it's a, it's a very good thing to do family planning like that. So it's not the same good whatsoever. And, and I would suggest maybe instead of good without God, maybe we could say we're gooder without God or, or better without God or something. So anyway, I think the solution is just accept that the natural world is all there is and everything will make sense. And I'm sorry I went over, over time there, Ben, but was I'll make that, it up to you. Was that a moral failure? Yes, <laughs> yes. Was that an Lord have mercy on my soul. Okay, so, um, where's my outline? Here we go. 
Okay, so now that we're at interrogation, uh, eight minutes both ways, and so uh, I, I'm going to interrogate Ben first. So, yeah, I put you on the hot seat, then I'll go on the hot seat. So we got eight minutes here. So Ben, one of my major things was, what do you think about, yeah, I said, I said the gospel, I mean, the heart of the gospel doesn't make any sense because Jesus sacrificed his, I mean, God sacrificed his own son. How is, that, that seems like a perversion of justice. I mean, how do you, how do you, how is that justice? How is that moral? I mean, it seems like it's immoral to kill somebody. Remind me where you went to school? <laughs> Luther Rice Seminary. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the question is, how is it moral that God sacrificed his son? Yeah, how is it moral to kill somebody else for, to, instead of somebody being held responsible for their sin, you kill somebody else instead? So um, I think I'll answer, and, and I did come prepared to like do a thing on you know the problem of evil and a theodicy. So, um, but. In answering your question, I think we have to tackle all these problems about um, examples of, of uh, God's supposed immorality in the greater context of what God's plan is for all of creation. And that is that he would agree that, um, that moral good does consist of human flourishing, but it would be his decision, his de definition of human flourishing. He has a much grander uh, view of what human <coughs> flourishing is than somebody like Sam Harris. Um, his grand view is that um, we live eternally. We aren't limited by this short little 80 years or whatever we get. We live eternally, and we live eternally without any pain or suffering or anything. Our little bit of suffering here is just a mere blip in the grand scheme of God's plan. And we live in the presence of the creator of the entire universe in uh, perfect harmony with what he originally intended. So that's the big picture. Now, the question is, um, uh, how does he accomplish that? Well, well, I'm, well, I'm asking about the sacrificial system. I mean, it seems like the, the uh, sacrificial I'm, system is I'm immoral. getting to that. Okay. I'm getting to that. So, in order for this perfect, uh, this perfect uh, creation to come about, um, we, the perfection in that comprises uh, both beings that can perfectly love, but are perfectly incapable of doing anything wrong. They achieve this, this standard that um, I say is from God, and I don't know where it comes from from you, but this ideal of human flourishing, it achieves it in uh, an amazing way. It, God has made us to be free creatures that are capable of love uh, so that we can love him. That's part of human flourishing. But a consequence of that freedom is that we also have the freedom to abuse it. And unfortunately, empirically, we can see that we do abuse that freedom and we violate um, the, the free will that we have by making wrong choices. And those wrong choices include hurting other people and disobeying God who has given us his, his moral uh, commands and duties. So how is he going to fix that problem? Um, basically, the consequence of our uh, abuse of our free will is that we die, okay? And we are separated from God. How can we come into, how can we restore the relationship uh, with God? Um, something has to, uh, something has to die, and either we die as a consequence of our failures, or somebody else can take on that death uh, willingly. And that's what God did when he manifested himself as his son. He willingly laid down his life in our place, died our death that we rightfully um, uh, deserve because of our sin, our failure. And in doing so, he restored, he, get, he provided a way to restore our relationship. And that's what salvation means in the, Christ, in the Christian worldview, which I believe is true. So well, Jesus, being in the form of man, came, 
He was fully divine. He was fully man. He took on our sin by dying on the cross. And that's the way that we get into the creation that God desires us to be in, which is a perfect relationship with him in perfect love, freedom from sin. So, so that's but, but, would you agree with me that if there was, let's say, for example, you're a judge and there's a murder, uh, a murderer over here, mm -hmm. and he's found guilty? Okay, nobody in here. Okay, he's found guilty, and somebody says, "Hey, I'll take the punishment for him. You can kill me instead." Would you consider that? Would you even consider that? I think the analogy only holds true with God. And, and people. So the only case in which this substitutionary system works, which is, you know, it's an offense to people, but it's also unbelievably like, you know, only God could have come up with this plan, that God would willingly take on the punishment that we deserve um, is the greatest act of love that could ever be expressed. Well, I mean, well, actually, to me, it sounds like it's just a pagan thing where Moses probably copied it from the other people. I mean, basically, there, if there, something's bad, like there's a drought or something, it's like the gods must be angry, let's sacrifice something. And then Moses got the whole sacrificial system going. He, he codified it, and that for this sin, you kill a dove. For this one, you kill a lamb or whatever. And, you know, even the Aztecs, I think it was... Um, they, they would sacrifice daily to make sure the sun would come up. I mean, these, the ancient belief is that you have to give something precious. Um, it, it doesn't seem to make modern sense. I mean, it just seems like, like even the Muslims today, you know, they, they do a, a parade and demonstrate and they cut themselves. What are they doing? They're showing how much they love God by hurting themselves. It's like, that's just, it that's, seems like it's primitive ideas. I think I agree that some of it is primitive in, some, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament sacrificial system. Um, it's a foreshadowing of what was to come through the Messiah, through Christ. And it, would, it kind of paved the way for and set the type and the example for what would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. Um, but I think that, uh, that so, the whole notion of but, but uh, so, sacrifice okay. is based on uh, a sense of justice, a sense of, okay. of, 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 of if we do something bad, then, then something has to pay for that. Well, well, just to summarize, though, so if it was a modern-day court situation, you would, not, you would say that does not apply here. You would never kill somebody for somebody else's sin. So you're saying this is a special exception only in God's case where this makes sense. I think so. I'd have to think through that example and see mm -hmm. if I could find uh, find an example in which I would say, well, yeah, it's okay for somebody. But the, the problem is, is that the examples with human beings is that human beings aren't perfect, so they can't... Okay, our time's up, too. Oh, okay. I mean, you can finish your thought there. We need more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I lost my well, so, I mean, in summary, I would say I, I think you have a big problem if you need an exception like, oh, yeah, this is justice, but, oh, yeah, well, it's not, we don't do that kind of justice. That was only God's justice. I, I think that's an indicator that there's a big problem going on philosophically. So I think the, 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 the problem is, is that uh, for that equation, that economy to work out, it only works out in the proper sense when you have a God-man relationship in that substitutionary atonement for sin because only God is perfect. Only God doesn't have to pay for his own sin. Only God is in a position to, to uh, atone for somebody else's sin. So it is a unique situation. But the principle is, is, is correct. It's just that people don't qualify. Okay, so now you can have eight minutes. Okay, so let's see. I have a bunch of questions, um, but I think I think really what the fundamental um, what the fundamental question comes down to is on naturalism. Where does where does oddness come from? When you when you say that you know when you make a statement like we ought to do things that lead to flourishing, where does that oddness uh, that prescriptive an obligatory thing come from. That's, that's the thing that I find is missing in naturalism and is present uh, when you have a, a creator God mm -hmm. who, who is 
by nature the reference point by which we can we can measure these mm -hmm. things okay I, I think the answer is really pretty simple the thing about flourishing is flourishing is by definition in my viewpoint what morality is all about morality is all about good leads to flourishing that's just by definition now the ought doesn't come into there the, the ought comes into if i say you ought to feed that starving kid over there it's like why because there's a destination we're trying to get to. What's the destination? That's trying to eliminate pain that children have. So if you want to eliminate pain, we need to feed them when they're hungry. So that's why you ought to do that if you want to be a good person. So it's just the oughts flow naturally so, on your goal. So, but I think this is where you know we're we're, we're treading on the equivocal, equivocal nature that I was talking about before, where we're saying ought in the sense of in order to accomplish a goal effectively mm -hmm. you do such and such. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is how do you establish the goal in the first place and how do you call mm -hmm. the, that goal to be something that we ought to do? How does that behavior or action that you're prescribing, where do you get the prescription for it in the first place? So, so the goal again was on flourishing. Right. So basically overall so you want to see... Like, like I'm saying, why ought we strive for flourishing. Where does the ought for flourishing come from? Okay, well that's, that's just the definition though of morality. Is it, is it, that's like saying why is, why is math about numbers? Why is math about numbers? That's why, no, I, that, I, that's why morality is about flourishing. Okay, well let me take it a different tack then. Um, what do we mean by flourishing and how do we define that? And what, what, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you say, well what I mean by flourishing is we ought to do such and such, or, or the world should, should be like this, to, because that's what flourishing is. Where does the shouldness come from on naturalism? Yeah, so flourishing is just a general term that means things are going really good, as good as possible. But, but the By, goodness, you're saying it's, it's good. Where does, the, mm -hmm. where does the good come from? Where does the good come from? Yeah. Now, where, does, where does the sense of... Well, you know, like for example, like if you're told you have cancer and you got one day to live, that's bad news. Nobody has to explain to you that's bad news, okay? Because that's going to hurt your flourishing. That's obviously your, your end near. And if somebody says you won the lottery, you got $10 million coming to you, that's obviously good news. Nobody's going to say that's bad news. Oh, why did you have to tell me? Oh, my, why me? Why did I have to win the lottery? You know, nobody's going to be like that. Well, actually, actually, I think, well, I won't go there, but... So, Okay, so let me ask. I, I guess I don't understand the question because it seems like it's really simple. I mean, it's really obvious. What is flourishing? Flourishing just means you're doing as well as possible. I think what's not obvious you're is that good. whenever, on naturalism again, whenever you come to, there is no like first principle upon which you can ground your oughtness or it should be this way or things should be that way or you, sh it's, you should win a million dollars and you shouldn't die. I mean, there's no, there's no reference other than our own opinions or what we prefer, there's nothing uh, objectively true about it. Well, let me, let, me, let me restate this and ask me what the problem you have with this is. If I say math is about numbers, mm -hmm. morality is about flourishing, mm -hmm. how is that not similar? How is that not the same because, thing? Because, because, again, math doesn't have any moral qualities. Math doesn't I know, they're two, they're two different things, right. Right. So, yeah. so, so th therefore, I don't have the problem with math because math isn't establishing that a right answer is morally good no, but, in some sense. No, but if, if, if I said math is about numbers, you could say, like, why numbers? Why isn't it about something else? Why do you pick numbers out of, it, out of the air? Because well, math is just by definition about numbers. Right, and morality is about, is about, is about, is about what ought to be. I don't see where we get oughtness okay. on natural. So that's, that's what I'm saying, that morality is about flourishing, and then when you want to flourish, now you know what you ought to do to get the flourishing. And, so and the ought just goes I, to a flourishing. Remember I said we would agree on certain things. Mm -hmm. I agree that if you establish uh, a moral principle of, of what is right in the first place, and then you use our reasoning and science to figure out how do we get there, then certainly, uh, you know, our reasoning and our science can help us to get there. I don't think, though, that science and reasoning can establish the, the, the goal in the first place. And that's, that's my problem with natural. Let, let me drop mm. that for, for a minute. Because I do want to ask another question um, and see if I can pack it into the, the time we have. Um, 
So let's say, let me, let's just grant that, that uh, what we ought to do is, is promote human flourishing. And would, do you think it would be fair to say that human flourishing is basically to minimize pain mm -hmm. and to maximize pleasure? Right. Okay. So what in your system would preclude this solution? And this is a thought question. Um, suppose I came up with a brilliant way to minimize pain. In fact, I can completely eliminate all pain, all human suffering uh, from now till eternity. Mm -hmm. I have this, I uniquely have this, this method. Um, and I can also make sure that you know, nobody, nobody ever experiences any pain at all. Okay? And here's what I do. I have this, I, I go around the world and I plant these little um, time release um, uh, euthanasia things that in one instant I can push my little button and immediately every person on earth will drift into oblivion, be dead, and have no more suffering and pain or anything will be completely gone. And I've completely eliminated human suffering. On your viewpoint, on your naturalism, what's wrong with that? Well, the, like I said, the one thing I talked about was the veil of ignorance. So you don't know, uh, it's a tool to help analyze. So you don't know which camp you're gonna be in. You might be the one with the implant or you might be the one pushing the button. Well, no, I'm saying I in mean, this thought experiment, right. everybody, Everybody, every human being, for that mm -hmm. matter, it could be every form of life. Mm -hmm. Completely dead, sterile, there's no more suffering right. at all. There's well, no uh, sentient right, suffering. Right, right. There's no, no. Now, yeah, I wouldn't, wrong, well, I wouldn't want that for me. Well, it would eliminate all your suffering. Right? You would, you would, you would but on no the big... Pain. You have no pain. It's yeah. like, well, that's the called the best way to yeah. get no pain or suffering. Well, that's called suboptimization. Like, no, it's perfect. It completely eradicates every form of suffering. I know, but, but there's other consequences it would cause that are bad. Who cares? Literally, who cares? <laughs> yeah, the philosopher, the moral philosopher does, because he has to look at all the consequences, no, all... The consequences are that, yes, it's, it's kind of a shame that nobody can experience any possible pleasure, but nobody's around to experience, so who cares? I mean, I would care. No, you wouldn't because you'd be dead. <laughs> you wouldn't be there to, be, to, to experience. No, but you told me in advance, do we want to do this? No, I didn't tell you in advance. Oh, I thought I, you were asking me in advance if it's good or bad. No, no, no. I'm saying in this thought experiment. I would say it's bad, the whole thing, especially if people aren't... I mean, this is like some mad scientist doing this without well, people's... Let me back up. I'm not promoting this idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I'm asking the question on naturalism. <clears throat> How can you argue against that? Because it perfectly eliminates all human suffering. That's, uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it does have the consequence, unfortunately, that we have no, like, all of our plans are no longer, and we don't have any pleasure, so we, we, we lose that. OK, so we're out of time, though. We're, fortunately, we're not around to experience the lack of the things that we won't experience. So. I think it's a perfect solution. On okay. We should do it. Well, I, I think in summary, you basically just need to look at the big picture. And, and up front, I think the question would be, is this a moral thing to do or not? And so then you have to look at all the consequences. And like I said, there's three things, reciprocity, consequentialism, and individual free rights. Those are the three um, criteria I would use to evaluate any moral question such as that even. So. Okay. So yeah, we'll s we're going to move on now. Uh, time for audience. And so we're looking for bold people who don't mind being on front of the camera. And we're not going to cut you off, let you dialogue a little bit with us if you want to. And you can just have a seat up here. Uh, for Ben. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the concept, for, from my worldview, mm -hmm. the concept of a divine giver of the ought, mm -hmm. the, the, the clear objective morals, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big jump from that to the Bible and Christianity or God's revelation of all that, mm -hmm. and who gets to decide. It's still, to me, it goes down to humans. Uh, humans are, wrote the Bible. Humans discern that the Bible is our, our moral pathway. It, it is our ethics. Mm -hmm. And it's something that humans claim this is the right one. The Muslims claim this is the right one. The Buddhists, this is the other. Buddhists, not so much. The Hindus, maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, to me, how do you get that jump from 
there, 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 there needs to be an ought. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a clear objective. Moral and Christianity has the lock on the one you can really count on to be from God. Right, right, right. So that, that, that's a good question. And I, I think that it points out the difference, the fundamental difference in category of the concepts that we're dealing with. One is moral ontology. That's the question of what, it, where does the oughtness come from? What is it based on? And then, then from there, it's like, okay, now how do we know what the right thing and the wrong thing is? What is moral epistemology? That's coming to know um, there. Then what uh, if, if it's God that's the source? Of, if it's a Christian God that's the source of, of morals, then what does He command, and how do we interpret that? And hmm, that's a uh, that's sometimes a difficult question. And I think the the challenges that we hear, like like Bernie gave a whole list of the challenging moral issues that um, we have to reason through. But that's that's a question not so much of where is it where is it founded, but how do we know what what those things are? So um, so we have to look at every system to see a whether um, they do provide a source of moral objectivism or whether it's subjective. If it's subjective, as I believe is the case with naturalism, then it's pretty much anybody's opinion, right? If it is objective and it's based on a divine being, then you're right. Who is the divine being and what does he commit? Those are, those are sometimes difficult questions, sometimes easy questions, sometimes very intuitive. I believe that um, God has placed within every human being a conscience that gives uh, moral directives, and that's why I think um, theists and atheists alike share a lot of common ground on on, on morality. I, I think it's because God has put it there in some way, uh, not because we just, you know, we're... Uh, in your, your Christianity, do you consider it a belief that you hold, or do you, do you consider it fact that I reject to my peril? The latter. I do believe that it's true. So I believe there are such things as truths and they're independent of whether I believe it or not. Dependent, it's independent of anybody's belief. The truth One minute. of the matter. Oh, but it's, so it's a fact that you're aware of. Yeah. and not a, not a belief that you have in your heart. Well, it's not either or. So it's a fact out there that I'm trying to learn about and I get a lot of it right and I get some of it wrong and it's a process um, of, of trying to get it right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, and we'll just go like four four minutes max, I think. Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Hi. 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 So I have um, a couple of questions, and so I'll make them quickly so we can get in on the topic. Okay. Um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was your question about justice concerning God and Christ's death on the cross. The thing that just um, I'm wondering from your perception is that Christ did become sin for us because he, it was he that knew no sin that became sin so that we may become the righteousness in God. But there was a choice that he made. God had him set aside as a substitution for our sin, but Jesus went to the cross willingly. So that whole idea of God putting his son to death, his son tread up that hill carrying that cross in his own strength. Can I interrupt you for there a little bit? Okay, so think about, did Jesus really have a choice? Jesus could have said no. Here he was, born, here he was God, became man, and he could have said no. I believe he could have, yes. I so, I mean, didn't God know what he was doing from the foundation of the world? Oh, I believe God I mean, did know what he was doing, and I also believe God from the foundation of the world in the Garden of Eden, saw man as a perfect being in perfect communion with him. I know, but I mean, but to, he had but, free will as well. So but to Jesus, say that he came from heaven, born of the Virgin, and became a man, and decided, "Oh, I'm not going to go through with this." Well, I, I guess mean, I guess I'm pointing my question back at you to say, how can that how can that whole idea of justice? 
come about when someone does something willingly. That analogy you gave of a person mm -hmm. out here committing murder mm -hmm. and someone willingly stepping forward and saying, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay the price for that. Maybe. Right, right. Okay. So I guess my sense of justice and yours is a little bit different because... Well, if you were the judge, you would... Ex let's say some, there was a murderer here and his father says, I love my kid so much. He's convicted murderer, but so please kill me instead. As a judge, you would do that? As a judge, I don't feel like I would have the ability to make that judgment. Just as Ben said, I feel like in the examples that we're talking about today concerning Christ and his substitution, substitution death for us, mm -hmm. that that God is a righteous judge, none of us can stand up and say that we are without unrighteousness. So that precludes us from being able to make those kinds of judgments. But I will say this, if what, what I don't feel I also would have the right to do is to say to that person that is saying, I'm willing to lay my life down for this other person, no matter what the circumstance is, I don't think I would have the judgment to be able to say, you can't or cannot do that. That's that's that person's own free will. You, you, but I thought you said as a judge you wouldn't you as wouldn't a accept judge, that. I, that's what I'm saying. As a judge, I would not have the right to make that judgment. Well, but you know you have no, you context, do have the but you do have the right. You, that's your responsibility to make a judgment, a no, penalty. I, you're, I guess you were just not. I would not be able to say to him, "You can take that person's." place. Why, That's the judgment I would be. But why not? Because you, you have the power to condemn this person to death. Murderer, you're going to, you're sentenced to death. And somebody else says, no, I'll do it for you. So either way, you're, you're going to make, you're going to make a judgment well, of somebody there's, dying. There's laws that are set in place in the court of law that I think would re preclude me from being able to act on. Yeah. That. And the reason why is because it would be immoral to do that. Okay. So, okay. So I just, yeah, I just actually just wanted to hear what your thoughts are, were on, um, Christ willingly and how that, mm -hmm. you know, comes into play from putting God off that seat mm -hmm. of injustice. Yeah, because yeah. Christ did willingly go. Right, right. And I don't think it makes any difference. Okay. And then my other question, um, very quickly, is when you guys were debating about this idea of oughtness and flourishing, um, what came to my mind is that, and I, I think this is what Ben was um, saying, um, is that in order for you to set up this um, standard of what flourishing is, there has to be a standard, right? Well, okay. First off, we're we're out of time, so you can summarize. We'll, we'll just make this really brief. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not saying it's a standard. I'm saying more it's a definition. Morality is about flourishing. That's by definition. But if I but if I say I'm going to flourish, I have to have a standard by means of what that would look like. Yeah, but you, you know what it mean, you know what flourishing means, don't you? Yeah, flourishing it's just it's just a word. It just means you're doing the best you can. And that's the goal. Okay. It's not so it's not what, a technical what, it's not a te technical word. It's not a hard word to to grasp. No, flourishing yeah. is not, but I'm right. saying there has to be a standard within each person of what flourishing means because what you might think is flourishing and what I might think is flourishing might be two separate things. And that, but that's a good discussion. And if we both agree yeah. that it's about flourishing, then we get together and we hash it out. What's but the best you, thing? Okay, so where does your standard for flourishing come from? It's not a standard. It's just a definition. We, we might have different ideas of what's flourishing in a situation, but that's just something we talk about. But at least we're on the same ground versus a Christian who might say, my morality is called divine command ethics. Mm -hmm which means God says it and I do it. I don't think about it. I don't think about flourishing. I don't think about anything. I just, what's written? That's how I do it. I don't use my brain. See, that's just it. For a Christian, myself being one, mm -hmm. I think of all kinds of things in God's word that tells me what I ought to do. But there's times where I choose not to do that. And it's not because God doesn't have this set of standards for me that would equate to flourishing. It's because I have free will. Well, I believe yeah. everything that God has in his word that is an ought would fit into your definition of flourishing. It's because he desires for us to flourish. But that's, the, that's where I just get a little bit um, on where you come from, is that if I set my own standard of flourishing, who, how, how, do I, how do I uphold that? 
Okay, well, we're, we're out of time. We're at six minutes now, so maybe we'll have a chance to talk more afterwards. Okay, right, thanks. Or somebody, and somebody else can follow up on, on your thoughts, too. Okay, so Brendan wanted to, uh, we're, going to, we're going back and forth between atheists and Christians. And... All right, so actually that said we perfectly where I was going with this. Um, what you both said is that the goal of morality is human flourishing. I find that actually to be a presumption. Atheists or Christian, I find that to be a presumption that the goal of morality is flourishing. So the question becomes, uh, so what, are, what are morals, where do they come from? Well, if you take away that presumption and go. Well, well I don't think Ben and I agree. We, yeah. I think we have a diff difference of opinion here. I, I say it's about flourishing. I, I haven't heard what he said well, it's about. Right. You, you said that, that ultimately you would be kind of leading toward God's definition of flourishing, right? Well, what I said was, Bernie's definition and Sam Harris's definition of flourishing is ambiguous. So it's hard for me to agree or disagree with it. If I say um, flourishing means to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then I'm all for it. Okay. If flourishing means rejecting God and saying he doesn't exist, then I'm not. Um, so help me out here on what we mean by flourishing. I think... I think um, well, I, it, the, the point that I'm, that I'm uh, stipulating here is that is that it, the definition of flourishing is irrelevant if, well, you, is. if, if you assume mm -hmm. that uh, to, that uh, morality has a goal. So um, let's say we take out take morality out of the system, to mm -hmm. take it out and look at what it would become hypothetically, and then say, why do we need morality? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, one thing that is true is that uh, philosophical naturalism and Christianity are both saying Here's why we need morality, because in the absence of it, we predict X, Y, Z to happen. So the question becomes is why? You know, maybe we define where morals come from by defining why we need them. Well, I, I would just say real briefly, the reason why we morality is all about good and right, good and bad behavior, and that's what morality is all about is trying to decide what's good and bad behavior. So. It's a major branch of philosophy, moral ethics. Right, and I think what, what we're, we're, we're saying is that in order to know what is good and right, you need to have a standard. And you need to have, your, if you're measuring like this is good and this is bad, it, it means that there's some reference by which you're measuring. It's kind of like temperature, okay? Is it hot or cold? Well, um, we need some kind of reference to, to measure whether, whether it's hot or cold. And... What we're measuring is an objective reality about, you know, having to do with the motion of molecules. And we're using a measure to, to like, determine that motion of, 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 of molecules. I think in naturalism, there's no equivalent, like, out there that says, this is, this is good and bad. It's, it, th so we don't, have a, we don't have a thing to measure. And that's what, that's what I think the key difference is between naturalism and theism is, and it boils down to whether or not our morals are ultimately subjective, that is, a property of human beliefs, or whether object, their objective, that is, a property of the, the, of the real world out there. I think that a property of the real wor world out there, established by uh, an authority, a perfect being, who is God, who holds that standard, that's the reference that we, we can measure to. We can't measure to our own because then it's my word against your word, and there's and we just go round and round. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing I'll, I'll, that for me that was for oh, that was for both of you. Okay. You both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you did good. One thing I'll I'll just mention that real quickly is um, Ben said we need a way of measuring the temperature if we talk about you know if something's hot or cold, but you know we. For example, you can also just talk more generally and say, like, we want this, this room is too hot or too cold, and we don't need a thermometer. We can just tell if it's too cold. I mean, if it was, a net, if it was 10 degrees colder in here, we'd all say, wow, it's pretty chilly in here. Yeah, you're missing the point, though. The point is, is that there's an objective thing out there. There's motions of molecules that are reflected in what we call temperature that we either measure or feel. Mm -hmm. I'm saying there isn't an equivalent, you know, out there hotness on naturalism. 
So. Okay. So I'm saying general flourishing is kind of like the temperature. I mean, it's, yeah. So anyway. Thanks, So are you, yes, um, are you aware that utilitarianism has a very long history in the West? Jeremy Bentham, John, Moore, John um, Stuart Mill, that the West, philosophers in the West have been wrestling with a calculus for hundreds of years, and generally they've failed. Um, you know, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. The French Revolution, I mean, to you, that would be heaven. The goddess of reason is worshipped. Um, we're going to have a rational society, and the result is slaughter. Because the, the question is far, far broader than just having a calculus. No, that wouldn't be heaven for me, just to interrupt you for go a little ahead, bit. Go ahead. Well, like I said, there's three principles I would use. I mean, human flourishing does not mean going around killing people you disagree with, like to in the you, French Revolution. To you, that's the problem, is you keep on assuming your vision is the only possible definition. There are communist versions of flourishing. There are Nazi versions of flourishing. There are extreme environmentalist mm -hmm. versions of flourishing. Mm -hmm. There are right. any number of ver ver versions. Right, right. And just to have a calculus, and by the way, look at Jeremy or Jeremy Bentham's calculus, and it's a lot more, well, there are a lot more points than just those three. Um, but, but, I, but I also said two other things too, like reciprocity and okay. individual free rights. And so for example, with the communists, if they're gonna go around killing people, that's a, that's a very gross violation on free rights. But you're, you're essentially taking what peep guys like you have tried to take this issue, come up with a couple of points, and the result has been slaughter of millions, because the issue no. is far too complex. Because it comes down to how you define the flourishing. And you may not like the, the Nazi definition, but you have to give a case, or the communist or the extreme environmentalist, but you have to give a case for why. I, I, I give you why, you because it, it violates individual what, what's rights. What's frustrating about reading you, people like Dawkins and Harrison is you make assumptions, and then you just self-evidently assume that your assumption is unassailable. That why? Why, why, in your, why should a, somebody that does not accept individual rights or equality, why is that less of a position than somebody that does? The reason why I, I use individual rights is because some moral issues require that. Like you said, if you didn't have that, that would be a glaring hole where abuses could come in. And so that's one of those Depending legs in the platform goal. that would... It depends on your goal. I mean, maybe, but anyway, I'll, I'll one yeah. more question. Well, the goal is a peaceful society, the flourishing. To you, yeah. to you. What if, what if I'm an extreme environmentalist and I think that, that we need to go down to 100 million people? Mm -hmm. You may not agree with that, but I have not heard any articulation other than some vague sort of, well, it's not flourishing, which is basically a safe box for you to hide behind. You don't, you, you've obfuscated this entire issue by not defining your terms, because once, if you were forced to define what flourishing is, you would have to set up standards and we could go after them and destroy them. And so you, you've hmm. created this safe little space that nobody can get at you. Well, you're, you're, well, you're, you're making it sound like flourishing is a difficult word to understand. It's, it's a meaningless word because it's so vague. There's no, you, you're using it in a way that's vague enough so that it can mean anything. It, it's, it's a meaningless discussion. No, and, no. Well, here's the thing, though. This is what Sam Harris says. Once people agree that it's about flourishing, that is a huge, huge... Um, major development in morality. Because the Christians, for example, they're not even in that game. They're into like divine command theories. Like, why is this good or bad? Well, because God well, said don't, it. Don't, don't, I, I'm a Christian and I'm also a utilitarianist. So, I mean, you're, you're making, you made straw men all, all night. You made little straw, your soteriology was nothing but a big straw man. But so, we do agree. Republicans and Democrats agree we should flourish. So great, Bernie, we all agree. The country is united. But they all have definitions of what that flourishing means, so it's meaningless. Okay, what's an, what, what's an example, though? Give, it a, give an example of what's a, di what's a uh, difference. The whole gay marriage issue. Okay, right. And that's a good discussion if it's about flourishing. That's but good. But they don't agree but, because but here's they have the different problem. standards. I know, but here's the problem. Some people, they don't bring in flourishing and what's good for society. They just say, I'm against it because it's icky. Or I'm against it because God said so. There's no brain thought processes behind it. That's the problem. If it's about flourishing, that's a good discussion. Does homosexual, does homosexual marriage 
hurt society? Good discussion. You just let's you, talk about it. You never question your own assumptions, and I think that's what's frustrating. Everything you think is just obviously self-evidently true. You just said a whole myriad of things that I that philosophers have spent millennium fighting over. I mean, I think for a lot of these guys, if you just take like a philosophy 101, like a survey course, I think it would help a lot of people like Dawkins and Richard Harris. But the other point, and one of the points we're, we're leaving well, out time, is time's up, al- altruism. Just... Altruism. That, that ultimately, uh, when 9-11 happened, some firemen went up to rescue people. They knew they were dead. Mm-hmm. They got the last rites going up there. Mm-hmm. That your the, the naturalist worldview cannot account for altruism. It cannot account for saving Jews from the Nazis and putting your own life in peril. Actually, I think it can. There's, and utilitarianism has nothing to do with may, that. Maybe not, but I mean, our biological system is the way we evolve. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't really want to throw my life away, but if my parents or if, if my kids or my wife was in danger, I would put myself in harm's way. We're not talking about your kids and life. It's the same thing. It's a tribal much. thing. Yeah. We're not talking about that. We're talking about altruism. Uh, Which yeah. means you give up your life for no possible it's, it's for your tribe, basically. No, you're, you're, you're doing a straw man. Mm, when when the people went up in 9-11, the firemen, mm-hmm. they did not, their wives and children were out up in the tower. They, the, the uh, it's America, though, I know. They're, the, America is their tribe. No, the, the, Jew, the Jews, the Poles that saved Jews from the Nazis that were putting their lives at risk, mm-hmm. they, they had no, it's not their tribe, it's not their family. That that is the heart of religion, that altruistic sacrifice. That's ultimately what Christian morality is about. And that is something that no naturalist I've ever seen make any sort of account or even attempt to because it's a joke. Your worldview is not broad enough to include altruism. Well, I'll tell you, there's the opposite thing, though, too, where people can rush off the war when they believe in God because it's like, I'm going to give my life for God and country. Hey, if I die, no big deal. I'm going to heaven. And, and that's an that's, that's extreme problem on the other side. But what, you didn't address what I just said. You just came up with an Yeah, you, I, I've never heard that objection before about altruism before. I mean, I've seen before where, like I said, in biology it explains a lot. The 9-11 one, I haven't heard that argument before. I can think about it. But people use our game theory. That's one, and I've studied okay. game theory. Game theory does not explain altruism. The other one I've heard is Dawkins' selfish gene, which is ridiculous. Um, that genes have any sort of a mind or... Anyway, that's a whole other... So, okay. So, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of things for you to consider. You're only just looking at the very surface here on all this stuff. Okay, well, I guess we can agree to disagree on that. Um, so, the person in the back has been waiting for a while. Um, so, uh, so, as I was listening, um, initially I was thinking that... Um, that that the goal of uh, your morality would be to seek your own good, but then it sounded like through discussing the flood and things like that that it's it's not a, a kind of a self seeking, but it's more of seeking the good of mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that got me thinking: um, <clears throat> what if uh, your body was infested with viruses and bacteria and parasites and you could take medication to kill off everything that you didn't want, but it would be bad for the parasites and so forth that were inside of you. Um, would it be moral to take the medicine and, and you know, kill those things that are living inside of you so that you can survive mm-hmm. when you're... And it's you know, Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, that would, that would lead to human flourishing. Basically, it's just medicine is what you're talking about. So, yeah. Yeah, and then I think one thing you're kind of leading up to also is... Um, Animal rights. I mean, in our in our state of human ma- maturity or immaturity, I mean, we are, we are starting to understand now about uh, morality is all about flourishing, and that's that's a big improvement. And once we get there, then the next step is going to be concerned more about animals, which some people are like vegans because they don't like you know the the animals suffering and stuff. So I mean. We need to go step by step. There's there's a lot of things there we need to do also. But so does does human flourishing take priority over animal flourishing then? See, that's a good tough question. And like I said, we're like in a society we're not even there yet because we're still trying to figure out about human flourishing. I mean, we we don't we're not even on the same page as that yet. So and and then so, kind of yeah. I'm, I'm I'll probably get the same response, but I want to ask just to see what you think. But would you know um, would adult flourishing take priority over 
children flourishing, or how do we make that hierarchy of, and, and would a, an elite mm -hmm. racist flourishing take priority over an inferior racist flourishing? A race, did you say? Yeah. Uh, you know, how do we, how do we rank? Yeah, I mean, well, as far as races, I mean, usually in biology they say there's no discernible difference. I mean, that's one, that's one thing about um, we need, where we need to mature. I mean, like I, I was talking about earlier, there's a, there's a lot of tribal morality. Like, our, like, for example, Americans are exceptional, right? Everybody, you know, France thinks they're exceptional. And we're, we're going to look out for our interests in the world. And where we need to get to is what they call a planetary morality, where we need to look at the world, all the humans, as one tribe. And so that's, you know, that's another place we're trying to get to. Um, and, uh, but, you know, just, I mean, but these are good questions as far as like, I mean, those are, those are good philosophical questions. Those are for a class, you know, it's like, would you save one child or a young child or an old lady who's only got one year to live? Who should you save if you, had, if you could only save one? I mean, those are good perplexing questions. But at least you're in the right area instead of saying like, well, God says this, or I think the right feeling is what I feel in my heart. I mean, those are going down the wrong road because they're not based on anything. They're not satisfying. Um, and uh, just in the remaining time, if you don't mind sharing, I'm curious, how did you become a Christian and how did you become a non-Christian? Um, yeah, I wrote a uh, Why I'm Not a Christian Anymore. Actually, on this uh, handout here, I have a free online book. It's called um, Modern Science of Philosophy Destroys Christian Theology. So basically, I left because of, as I learned more about science and philosophy, especially biology and neurology. But I was raised a Roman Catholic. I was confirmed in around high school time. And then uh, right after college, I became a born-again evangelical Christian, about 1984. And since then, I grew in the faith as an evangelical born-again Christian. And then in 2007, I left the faith. No, 2009, actually. And what was it yeah. specifically that you saw in science that drove you? Um, yeah, okay, well, I got a minute, I guess. Um, like I said, uh, yeah, in science, for example, with biology, with evolution, we know there's no such thing as a first human. There was no uh, Adam, first biological human. And so basically that really does a lot of damage to the gospel. And then in neurology, we find out that there is no soul. There is no you in your brain. What you are is a composite of everything your brain is doing. Um, so in a nutshell, if, if there's no you, little you in there, there's nothing to resurrect. I mean, we are basically a, a biological machine. We're a meat-based computer versus a silicon-based computer. How do we get a botanist from that? So, you know, if there's no ghost in the machine, there's no ghost to resurrect, and that's the heart of the gospel. It all goes out the window once you realize there's no ghost in the machine. So, um, I have a question from Chad. I don't know. Probably. I haven't gotten yeah. a question for a while. <coughs> All right. My question really isn't about moral, morality. So uh -huh. my question is, why would God send us here to earth for a test to go to heaven or hell when he already knows what we're going to be since he knows the future? That's a good question. Um, so he sends us here so that... Um, we can find out for ourselves. Yeah, but like he already knows the future. Yes. What's the point of us finding out? So us? his his knowledge isn't what's important because you're right. He already knows the future. The question is, uh, do we know? And that's what we're here to find out. And we can know because he's told us how we can know. And the way we know is. Uh, through the gospel. And it was what Shelley was talking about, how we do things that um, we shouldn't do, we know that we shouldn't do, and um, those are bad things. The Christians call it sin, yeah. and that sin, in, the, in light of how good God is, that sin is really bad. It's so bad, in fact, that God would have the right to actually uh, to put us to death because of that sin. But instead what he does is he allows us to make a free choice to accept what Jesus did on the cross 
so that Jesus would, pay, would take the price that we should have paid, and from that, then we can come into a right relationship with God, and through that right relationship with God, we can enjoy eternal life with him, and that's what flourishing really is about. So if we can agree, Bernie and I can agree on that as being the definition of flourishing, then yes, we're all for that. So. Uh, it's not about God knowing, it's about us knowing yeah, and actually us asking. knowing, but like there's some people that are born in North Korea mm -hmm. in prison camps and mm -hmm. don't even, or like let's say Africa and mm -hmm. are raised as a Muslim for their whole life mm -hmm. or under a dictator and they don't even have a chance to know about Jesus or never even heard about that Jesus in their whole lifetime. Well, I know that God is, is the ultimate fair person fair being. He is perfect. So somehow he's fair in what comes out. So in the case of like North Korea, actually a lot of North Koreans do find out about Jesus and they do come to know him and amazingly they escape that terrible place and they uh, they can flourish. No, they're um, brainwashed over there. They're all brainwashed. Sad. And I would agree that that is really bad. And the people who brainwash to serve him the supreme leader. Yeah. That's, they pretty much worship him as a god. I know. I, really I've seen the video, uh, and it really is bad. And I agree that's an example of objective evil. So I believe that that what the dictators uh, in North Korea are doing is really wrong. And I believe that a just God would make sure that that the people that do that really wrong stuff actually have to pay for that. And that's what justice is all about. On the same time, he's gracious enough that even those people that do those really bad things can accept Christ's forgiveness. And even the leaders there, believe it or not, if they truly repent and truly say, I'm sorry for what I did, it was so, wrong, then they too. But what can, about the victims? Like the ones that probably never like in the prison camps, like starving to death as a child doing that. I'm gonna start in the prison camps. Yeah, what about them? Like, how are they supposed to know about Jesus? Are they given a trial or what? Well, either they'll learn about him some way or from creation. The Bible says that even through creation, what we can see in creation testifies to the truth uh, that God exists, that we have a conscience that tells us right and wrong, that testifies that God exists. And if we... Uh, acknowledge that even if we don't know specifically um, the name Jesus if we trust in God um, that he is merciful that even if we don't really know him as Jesus and don't understand exactly how that works or if, maybe if we're a little kid and we don't really understand complex theology and all this we can still be saved and we can still have a relationship with him that is great in this life and helps us flourish now, but more importantly, it helps us flourish forever and ever, and that is true flourishing. And that's what Christians believe. Okay, uh, just one little follow-up comment on there. Um, he asked about why people are born if God already knows what's gonna happen to them. He already knows everything about it, so why even go through it? And you said, because we need to go through it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, what about, um, Women, the miscarry, the natural miscarriage rate is so high, it's like 70% or something, that women have miscarriages and didn't even know they were pregnant. And then, of course, all the children that die, even under one years old. So why would they be born? I mean, they, they had no chance. You make it sound like it's about us, but all these people died without even being aware of that they're alive. Well, it's, it's very plausible that miscarried children uh, uh, go straight to heaven. So maybe they're the most flourishing of us all. And maybe what we see as What would they be in heaven? Like a 30-year-old? I mean, they wouldn't even have a brain. Mm, no, I think it works differently in heaven because humans aren't all about their chronological um, maturity. They're about the fact that they're human. Okay. All right, so who's next? Uh, how about how about right? Yeah, go ahead. I rather than than ask you a question, I'm going to tell you both of you. I'm going to tell you my conclusion from watching the two of you. And let me say this: at age 12, 
I got up from the, my church and left and never went back mm -hmm. because they couldn't seem to answer my questions mm -hmm. in a rational way. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> I sat and listened here. And uh, this person that you talk about, God, doesn't make sense to me. And so I have gone in a different direction. I find that Zen Buddhism is more rational and suits me. It probably isn't going to suit anybody, but Christianity disturbs me. Oh, it, can it, I, can I, do you think that Zen Buddhism is true and Christianity is false? No. no. I, I, I don't say Christianity is false. I say it disturbs me. I think it's... But is it true? What do you mean by true? Define true. I mean, is it an accurate reflection of reality? No. Okay. No. Is, is Zen Buddhism true? Yes. Okay. Is it an actual explanation of reality? Mm, it can be. It it's more spiritual. It is not looking at a god. Um, How does it, it split? Oh, sorry. It, it it's just, just, you're asking the question. Is, it, this is, well, you're, we you're can making, go. You're making claims about truth and not No, truth. not just, claims. I'm telling you how I feel watching this. And it brings back the reason I walked out at age 12. is because the concept is so... Unbelievable that it contradicts itself. Christianity contradicts itself. Um, doesn't always ring true. Um, why we have to have a, a society that looks at punishing is beyond me. I don't get it. You don't um, in justice. I don't believe in the way it's Christianity carries it out. It's very judgmental. It can be very ugly over time. On what, I basis, have, on what basis do you... The treatment of women, women's place in society, mm -hmm. um, abortion issues, what are the you? freedoms of women. What, what, um, what, what about the abortion issues? I think that's, a, that's a, an individual choice. To it is what? not... To do what? To decide one way or the other. To do what? To decide what? To end that child's life. Okay. One minute. But it isn't the so church's you're... responsibility to to pass that so judgment this is, this on him. This is my daughter right over here. Do mm -hmm. I have the Do I have the moral authority to decide whether to end her life? You know that's a ridiculous question. Well, it is. I agree. It's a ridiculous <laughs> question. Because <laughs> there she is. We all know because what there she is. Right. But you no, just said, no, we don't all know. But that's, you just that's said, what this conversation is about. No, wait, we wait, do wait, not wait. all know. Why then is it a ridiculous? If we don't all know, why is it a ridiculous question? I'm serious. Well, if because I, there if she a is. Woman, if a woman has the right to kill the child, which is mm -hmm. what you just said, abortion was, why can't I kill my child? Well, you probably could if you wanted to, but so would it be right? I'm not saying that. I'm not wait. saying that. She's, wait, 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 wait. She is you not in the womb. womb. She is not in the no, womb. This is, I mean, she I, is not an egg. She is a gr she is a living being. That's right. And what is the thing that we killed that you just called well, a see, child? We have time, so some, just summarize see, where so you're there, at. Here. So there, there you have it. I think there my, you have it. I think actually is, my world is this is parsing, very clear it is parsing of reading. all of this stuff. And instead of listening to what is being said, you parse it and ask me if I think it's okay for you to kill your daughter who's sitting over there, which makes no sense to me at all. That's what I'm telling you. It makes no sense. What makes to no me. sense to me is for you and, to easily. And you are sitting there trying to judge me, and that's the first thing you came up with. What are you doing? Was to, to judge me? Judge me. Judge me. <laughs> I'm not judging you. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not judging you. No, I just said it was a ridiculous question. No, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> you, 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 in a roundabout way, 
Well, and, and a way I think is a little snarky. Okay, opinion. that's okay. We don't need to blame each other. It's, it's fine. You equated a, a fetus in a womb to a someone that's a beautiful 18-year-old uh, girl. And, and, and in your view, it's the same thing. In other people's view, if that fetus has not attained any self-consciousness yet, it, it, it is not the equivalent. Is there, in your view, and it's not. If it's and it's not. It's not my job, my right, nor your right, mm -hmm. to pass that judgment on to someone else who is having to make a very painful decision. That is that person. So it's not relevant to me. It's not relevant to you unless you, at this moment, have to make that decision for a myriad of reasons that none of us can probably identify. Okay, all right, thanks. But the question is not the 16-year-old. The question is a fetus, say, five months that's viable, or six months. See, that's where it gets complicated. If you want to talk about, like, you know, a couple, no. the first trimester, fine, but then that puts you in a very problematic okay. moral position. So we need, I want we need, to make, that's make, the problem. I want right to make there. a reminder. The problem is you're judging. You're doing exactly yeah. what you're Okay, let's, 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 let's have some order, though, here. Everybody's got some strong opinions. We just need to chill a little bit. I remember, so if I'm guilty of this, I apologize. I remember at the beginning we said, this could get emotional, could get heated. If I'm contributing to that, I apologize. I want to tone it down a little bit. And, and, and so. But, and I, I just say, too, I think to be fair, um, what Ben was trying to do, and I think we just, we have a problem here with the lack of time, but he's basically given a, I think he's trying to do a philosophical thought experiment where, you know, we can look at some extreme situations and then let's find out where the slider is and where it gets complicated. I mean, that's one thing you can do, and we just don't have the time to do that in this quick Q&A right. time. And so. it, it, gets, okay. it, it gets, or it has gotten very confused, maybe trying to talk about that yeah. in short Yeah, I mean, abortion is a big topic and we're well, trying to do it in, you know, that, one minute, it's you know. the whole philosophy yeah. of God and not God okay. and where morality is and how you live your life is a very difficult, broad okay. um, question. And um, sometimes it gets really knotted up with how Christians see Mm, see morality and humanity. Okay, well, no. Well, 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 thank well, you. Might be. We need, it we need might, to move on. It might on. well be. But I'm trying to explain to you why I find it so mm -hmm. confusing. Okay. So difficult to believe in. You, you, Can I just no, no, we, we, need, to, we no, need to move on. Not, not publicly. I want to say something to you. But, okay, should we? Um, Sure. And thank you for sharing. I mean, it's, this is what it's kind of nice for people to share because when they share, they're out, they're also formulating their thoughts. So, you know, this is good for everybody else to listen to. Also, all right. So, I, I, I just want to clarify. We talked a lot about flourishing, but I want to talk about uh, uh, what's wrong and bad and leads to pain. You said that that always leads to pain. So, I want to know: is pain always bad? Well, I would say in the very definition of morality, it's minimizing pain, maximizing pleasure, and flourishing. So yes, obviously, so pain is bad because that's what we're trying to do is so we're minimizing about, it by definition. Are you talking about physical pain, mental pain, anguish, sadness? Yes, all of all it. Of all of it. All of it. So have you ever been to the dentist? Yes. Has he ever given you a shot that mm -hmm. causes pain? Yes. But what's the ultimate result of that? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the ultimate is flourishing, yeah. Right, so pain isn't always... Yeah. Right. That's why I'm saying look at the big picture. A little bit of pain is for better flourishing later on, so therefore it's a good thing to do it. Mm -hmm. okay, but, and so you believe that extinguishing most pain, but not all pain? Well, again, it's again, it's the end result. So the end result is I have a lot of pain with a really nasty tooth that needs to be repaired. So I go through a little bit of pain for the end goal of flourishing overall, getting the problem fixed. So I do some pain. I go through the pain because of the flourishing and the end result. All right. So see my because sure see my another another choice is I could do nothing, and that's just going to be pain, pain, and more pain. All right. I mean, so, if, so if, there if, is if, good pain. You're, you're saying that there's I'm good. saying pain can be justified because right. of the end result of overall flourishing. All right. Yeah. All right. That's all yeah. I want to know. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Heidi. So I was wondering if I could make a statement and then receive comments because I have some explanation of um, why God died for us. And just want to know what you think of it. Uh, after, well, we'll, we just have time for the third one here. And, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're kind of running over board. So flourishing can be contradictory in terms of survival of the fittest. For example, spreading a man's sperm may cause him to flourish while diminishing the raped women. And so I think that the example of feeding children was not sufficiently complex. Since God created humans with freedom of choice, he limits his power. He does not have all power because he cannot at the same time allow freedom of choice and uh, prevent evil. Um, he, he could have made us all with artificial intelligence so we could only experience pleasure, um, you know, a positive behavior and flourishing. But he chose to give us freedom of choice and thus allow evil, which is the result of the people who choose evil. Since he made us, he is taking responsibility for the evil by dying himself for us to demonstrate the result of freedom of choice that results in evil. He then, it, it, he then invites us to accept his death so that he may heal us to perfect flourishing. Um, and now with an understanding of the consequences of... Uh, disobeying his morality so that now with understanding we are doing morality from freedom of choice and flourishing perfectly. Um, and by the way, in terms of creating humans, um, the Jews understand that spirit, translated ruach, means the living body. So there's no homunculus floating off um, for, to immortality the living body is the spirit, and when a person dies, there's no more spirit. Resurrection is a new perfect body with the same personality, memory, uh, um, uh, choices, um, and so on, the same patterns put back into a new perfect body. That's interesting. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's not traditional evangelical Christianity, it's not, so it's, an inter it's a different, interesting discussion. You yeah. can definitely support that from Bible teaching. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, people argue about the Bible all the time, different, yeah. Okay, so do you want me to interact with some of the things you said? Sure. And, and, <clears throat> do you have a question embodied in that? Well, I, I, I no, could... No, I said I wanted to make a statement and get reaction. Okay, I got, I got like three things. One is you mentioned survival of the fittest. I want to make clear that evolution is science, not morality. Evolution explains how we got here. You, you don't say, well, that's how we got here, therefore that should be our morality. Uh, we have these complex brains, and we can determine our own fate. We can say, hey, you know what? It's about creating a flourishing society. That's what it should be about, not, not um, survival of the fittest, killing all the other species and, and doing all that. So, so basically, morality is about doing good and bad, you know, doing right or wrong, and it has nothing to do with evolution. Evolution is science. So I'm saying don't conflate the science with the morality. Does that make sense? I mean, let me interchange with you on that. Um, I don't believe that evolution is science. I think that's, and I'm not selling this book. Stephen C. Myers um, wrote two books, Signature in the Cell yeah. and Darwin's Doubt, and I believe this evidence points to intelligent design which does not have to be God. No, no, but I think getting to intelligent designer as the coder is science. No, but here's my point, though. I mean, whether, whether evolution is true or not, you mentioned evolution in regards to morality, and I'm trying to say evolution has nothing to do with morality as far as determining what's right and wrong. I mean, it's good at explaining why we are the way we are, but it's not good at explaining what we should be doing. Does that make sense? So you don't you don't believe that evolution had a role in crafting morality from the natural? Um, well, like I said, there may be some things like altruistic behavior that could be explained with evolution, but as far as what is right and wrong has nothing to do with evolutionary theory. We don't ever say this is right because of evolution. That has nothing to do with morality. Evol morality has to all to do with flourishing, not evolution. 
So I just want to be clear about that. Evolution is survival of the fittest. I mean, that's how you choose the new. That's how species arose. See, evolution explains how the species came to be, but not how it should behave. How you should behave is morality. And we have complex brains, and so we talk about this. Monkeys, for example, don't talk about morality. They don't have the complex brains for it. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, you mentioned about these uh, evil, well, okay, I think we should probably stop this over five minutes. So. Oh, oh. at least say what? Evil what? And I didn't know <laughs> okay, well, you made it sound like evil was the amount of free will, but like when I said Jesus brought a tsunami, that has nothing to do with free will. That's no, Jesus I did causing this to have it. I okay. said free will allows evil. Okay, but there's natural evils that have nothing to do with free will, like the tsunami, for example. God yeah. did not cause that. Did Jesus cause that? Does he hold that title, that tsunami together? Yeah. We're in an enemy um, camp. There is a Star Wars. Uh, freedom of choice allowed evil. Evil happens. It causes in consequences that, that affect people okay. who have nothing to do with the choice. Okay, well, well, so now you're saying that tectonic plate action is evil. Which was, okay. that, that's that, not really that evil. That goes into, we don't have time to get into that. Okay, stop, okay. I have some thoughts on that, but yeah. we don't have time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Last question. Okay. This is my daughter, so it must not I, be for me. Nope. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you'll be grounded for months. Um, so, as you well established, the, uh, you believe that... Um, the um, moral, what is morally right and morally good leads to flourishing. So, for our instance, if there was like a, um, well, there is like mutations and deformities and diseases that are genetically passed, that's obviously not going to lead to flourishing. So, would the morally right thing be to stop that disease and kill off, since it's genetically passed, kill those who have it, and that would lead to flourishing? Mm -hmm. So would so, that be morally right to kill those people mm -hmm. who are carrying the disease or mutation or right, whatever? Right, right. So, so again, this is a good example for we want to have an end goal. Let's say the end goal is eliminating or reducing um, illnesses that are inherited, mm -hmm. right? So now we have all these different choices to pick, okay? One is let's kill all the people who are passing on these bad genes. Another one is well, maybe we could somehow isolate them without killing them. Maybe another one is, you know, we could try to cure it with a drug or something. And so when, you, when we analyze all these different choices to see which is the right path to take, remember I said it's like a map, which is the right path to take, which is what's the right action? Like I said, I use three, um, three, three principles. One is reciprocity. I would, want, I would treat other people the way I want to be treated. Consequentialism, what would happen? if we kill people like that. And the third one is the individual free rights. And so usually, I mean, any kind of solution, there's always a solution for any problem of, hey, let's just kill the people. You know, like, here's Muslims causing a problem. What should we do? Let's kill them. I mean, it's the, that's always one option out there. And it's usually the one that's always rejected right out of hand because it's such a violation of individual free rights. So that's kind of the easy one to dismiss. I mean, as soon as that's an option. So, and there, you know, there's better things we can do, like maybe they could be sterilized. That, I could see where maybe society could say, like, you know, everybody that has a really bad gene that's passing on something that's guaranteed, let's sterilize them. So that becomes the morally right thing to do. And if you have a child that has this disease and they don't want to get sterilized, that's immoral. It's like, why is this person being so selfish and rude and mean to pass on these bad genes? So th that, that's a way where society says, you know, that's the good thing. It's, it's actually immoral not to do it. So. Would it your, it be your individual free right to choose not to get sterilized, though? Yeah, see, those, those are, that's, that's why I say I have three things, because maybe that, there, that could be a problem. So that's a good discussion to have. You know, somebody might say, like, hey, for me, that's a big violation of individual rights. We shouldn't do that. But what if you had no so. other option? It was just kill off people, that's it. Or, or, or it infects the rest of the world with there's two options, kill everybody or, or everybody gets affected, is that what you said? Right. Um, these are complex questions, but see, 
I, I see, but I think it takes a long time to talk about it, but see, the thing is that we could agree is that we're, the, we're all looking at it from an aspect of what's the end goal and flourishing. You know, do we want to be in a world where these people are killed? Maybe we do. Do we want to be in a world where they're not? I don't know. Let's talk about it and discuss it. What are the alternatives? You know, Ben might just say, hey, the Bible says this, or God said this. There's no discussion about it. There's no right or wrong. It's just what God said. And I think that's the, the most terrible way to go about it. Somebody else might just say, hey, I, this is what I feel the answer is. How do you explain it? Well, it's just a feeling. That's another terrible way to go about it. So I think if you talk it out with flourishing as the end goal, that's the best possible way to, to, to do it. I want to make sure that everybody's clear that I don't make moral judgments just without thinking. So. <laughs> yeah, but you think about what God commanded and that's it. Uh, no, it's not it. I think about what God commanded. I can think oh. about whether I'm understanding what God commanded, commanded. I'm taking the entire scripture. I'm including my conscience. I'm looking to counsel to other people. I take moral judgments very seriously. I think they're very important. And so, um, you know, I, I, I do reject the idea that I just like willy-nilly, you know, just make decisions. Okay, so it's time for our summary. Thanks for your question. Uh, so five, five minutes, yeah, you can start, and five minutes each. Okay. So um, we can talk about, this has been really great, by the way. It is a little, like, I can tell it's, it's got some, uh, some emotion to it, but I think it was a good discussion. Uh, I like the challenge for clear thinking that I heard expressed. I don't know if we've done a great job, but I do know that there are a lot of um, Christian philosophers who do do a great job uh, of clear thinking, I would encourage you to, to, to seek them out. I um, thought a lot about how to close this out, and what's, what's really weird is, is I'm going to close it out a little bit different because uh, we've talked a lot about flourishing and the vision of flourishing. And I, I do agree that uh, the right, if we have the right definition of flourishing, which I believe is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, then I'm all for that goal, and I think that is the foundational principle upon which uh, we live. And I also think that the, that the Christian view of, of reality is really expansive in terms of flourishing because it does offer eternal life. It doesn't limit this life to the mere experiences we can have here in the temporal world, but instead it extends it to eternity. And the Bible promises us just unimaginable riches in our relationship with God. And I think that vision is so overwhelmingly more powerful than the myopic vision that, that a naturalist perspective can give, that it's really worth pursuing um, uh, with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. I know Bernie, from, from years ago, um, was a Christian. So he held fairly strong points of view that were Christian views. And somewhere along the way, things happened, and he changed his view, OK? So that establishes a precedent, and people can change their view. I, on the other hand, I was an atheist. I was much like, uh, I held views much like Bernie does today. And I changed my view. But I want you to think about the consequences. There's, there's, a, there's a complete asymmetry of the consequences of going one way versus the other. For Bernie to give up his Christianity and bet on his naturalism means that he's potentially throwing away the most grandest vision of flourishing ever conceivable on the basis of, you know, Whatever it was that, that, that changed his mind from one thing to another, okay? Now, it could be that he could change his mind again because he's done it before, and I hope so. And that change in mind could, be, could come from more study or some new bit of evidence. I know he's a, he's a rational thinker. That may change him back to um, Christianity. But think of the consequences and the stakes involved. I would encourage him and people that I've heard tonight who have abandoned this to really think hard about, gosh, shouldn't I spend the rest of my life really 
finding out whether it could be true, and even if I'm not certain, and nobody's certain, why don't I, does, isn't it just so much more rational to put your bet on the vision of eternal life, pain-free, uh, in, in glorious communion with the creator of the whole universe, that it is to put your bet on 80 years here, maybe, and then nothing. It, you know, our stakes are too high, our knowledge is too little to, to, to not, um, you know, to risk that opportunity on the basis of what we know and our, you know, our fleeting changes. So, gosh, that's what I want to encourage us to do. I want to encourage all of you who are questioning and maybe coming away thinking, gosh, I'm not really sure what the basis for my morality is. I don't have a rock solid anchor. There is one, and we may not clearly know it, but go after it because it's it's worth eternity. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll close with this. I, I think morality is a very simple, it's a simple thing to understand, but you know, the questions can be complex and you can have some really good discussions about what's the right thing to do. I mean, very simply, it's just the distinction between what's right and wrong. And like I said, uh, right and wrong is all about leading to flourishing or leading uh, and trying to minimize pain. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, being a former Christian. You know, it's, it's, it's hard for Christians to believe this or understand this, but I really, you know, I really did have a personal relationship with Jesus, I thought. I felt like I was led by Jesus. I was led by God. Which seminary should I go to? I prayed about it, and I felt like I was led to that. I, I felt like, you know, God answered my prayers and just, yeah, really had a relationship. But, you know, now I see it as a delusion. I, I think God is a fictional character just like Santa Claus is a fictional character, the Easter Bunny. And this is, this is hard for Christians to understand because it's like, I, I feel it so deeply. How could it be possibly? Well, you know, one example I would give is like a child can really feel deeply about Santa Claus, have a relationship with Santa Claus. Um, you know, and maybe their mind, maybe they're, they're all let down when they found out Santa Claus is not real. Maybe they feel like they're just, you know, lied to and all this. So just because you have a feeling of a relationship doesn't mean it's real. And so anyway, that's just something I want to put out there. Um, basically, I think it is a delusion, and it, it is a spell that you're under, and I think I only got relieved of it because I learned more about science and philosophy. To, um, my daughter has a four-year degree in uh, general science, and they never even took one philosophy course, and so there's a lot of scientists who don't know anything about philosophy. I had a four-year degree in electronics, never took one course in philosophy, so I had to do all this learning on my own time, basically. Um, one thing I wanted to say too is there, there are people who become, you know, they're, they're, they go from atheism to Christianity and Christianity to atheism. But I don't think it's the same flow at all. In fact, you know, if you look at polls, uh, they show that, you know, those leaving religion are, are growing and it's almost, it, it, it's really ramping up actually. I think it's because of YouTube and the internet. Uh, because before people didn't really know atheists, atheists has a bad um, image. Uh, but as more and more people are coming out, it's really making people question and think about these things. And so uh, anyway, it's, it's not an e equal flow, I think, going back and forth. And one thing that's kind of ironic or paradoxical, I think, too, is um, it seems like the, uh, some of the pe it's easier to actually leave Christianity when you are more educated in it. So, for example, um, and, and, the, and the reason why, I think, is because, for example, I have a seminary degree. And when you have a seminary degree... You know the tough questions, you know what people have talked about, and you know what there's no answers for. But the general person who goes to church, they may not know what's going on, but then they, they figure, well, my pastor does, and they ask the pastor. And of course the pastor is going to tell them something reassuring, because that's their job description. They want people to, to go away and say, oh, pastor, that was a great sermon. A pastor is not going to have a sermon and say, let me tell you everything I doubt and all the problems I'm trying to sort through in my life. They'll never do that. Their goal is to build up your faith so you can say, hey, pastor, that was a great sermon. I, my faith is so much stronger today. So, so the pastors or those who went through seminary, they actually kind of know what, what's out there, and they know there's no answers versus the general person in the pew. Um, 
you know, so like there's people like John Loftus and Jerry DeWitt. There, there's some of these former preachers who are writing books now, and I think this is just more and more of these so people. So are you basically saying that Christians are stupider than atheists? No, I'm actually saying the, the more you learn about religion, the actually easier to leave, to leave because you know there's you know you know basically where the, there's no answers instead of asking somebody. Um, so basically, I, I want to say if you have a naturalistic worldview, everything makes sense all of a sudden. It's like, why was there a tsunami that killed 200,000 people and displaced millions of people? If there's a loving God in charge, how does this stuff make sense? Everything makes sense with the naturalistic worldview. It's plate tectonics. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I've been in Christian debates where they say every worldview has problems. And it's like, I don't know of a problem with, with, with my naturalistic worldview, seriously. I, there's tons of problems with, with, like I said, with the gospel message. There's, there's a lot of things that don't make sense because they're philosophical inconsistencies. But personally, I, I really don't see any with naturalism. So I'll leave it there. And... Since I had the last word, I may have thrown out a barb or something, so I'll give you a chance to... <laughs> just one? No, I just, I'm just, just Ben, sorry. I know you guys all want to say something, but just Ben, just, you know, you can... Uh, I'll I, give you... I, I just want to defend um, that there are <clears throat> um, uh, very intelligent Christian thinkers. Um, there are some unintelligent Christian thinkers. Uh, there's some intelligent atheist thinkers, and there's some unintelligent atheist thinkers. And so I don't think um, any one camp has a monopoly on intelligence or not. So I do want to defend the fact that, um, honestly, my experience has been very positive in engaging with intellectual Christianity. And I think there's a real revolution and, and renaissance going on. The challenge is to seek, that, seek those uh, resources out. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, I love to share the... the, the um, we have it on here, the, too. we got a bunch of links on the back, back uh, here. Uh, I would promote... Um, we have a, a chapter of reasonable faith uh, in the area. We talk about theological and philosophical issues like this. We discuss um, arguments for God's existence. We discuss arguments uh, supporting Christian theism. And we discuss uh, arguments against it. And we welcome uh, all camps to participate in that. And we do strive for clear thinking in it. So, um, that's my Okay, and thank you all for coming. I hope you got something out of it. So, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for inviting me here. You're welcome. Good job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.